Hello and welcome back. Okay, in the first part of this sound series, I built this circuit, which is a very basic single tone sound output, and that's designed to hook up to my CPU here. And so today, what I'd like to do is plug this in and see if we can get it to produce something more interesting than one tone at a time. Now, things are getting a bit packed, so I think I'm gonna take the UART away because that's not entirely necessary for us to be working on this. Okay, so it's bus, the bus connection from the UART can plug into here. Move this across a little bit. I really do need some more space. I'll have a, a bit of extra room once I finish turning the ALU into PCBs here. Okay, I have plugged this into the device 9 header and I don't have any assigned output ports to manipulate that, so that's probably what we need to do now. That's going to involve pipeline stage 2A, I believe. Let's have a look at adding that. Okay, so we just need to add an IO port register audio data so we're just adding one instruction for outputting register A to that that's all we need isn't it Right, so the first value we out is going to be the most significant byte, but we want the top bit set and the bottom bit set if we want to generate our middle C. 081. And then it's B8. Actually, it's that top bit low will enable it to go out. And if we put a break in, that should work. That should be a good test. That will output the middle C automatically. Now we need to implement this out instruction. It should be very straightforward though. We've done plenty like it before. Very similar to one of those. So we are turning the A register to uh, assert to the main bus, and then we want to load audio data. And we put that on device nine. Okay, as expected, it's pipeline 2A is the only ROM that's changed. I really do need to construct a better way of getting small programs back into the build. Blowing the ROMs each time is uh, quite time consuming. All right, let's power it up and see what happens. That's promising. It's in break mode. So now I should be able to step the outputs stop it nice okay well that's that's worked first time I'm going to tuck this down here this LED is the only thing of any relevance to us so let's write some more interesting code okay I've been having a think about what I could do now I think we can give this circuit a little bit of a test drive by just scrolling through all the possible outputs. If we start A and B at zero and then increment them, so 
we want to output the high byte first and then the low byte. So there's two cycle gap between them. We do an ink and an ink with carry to move on to the next value. So this is going to start at zero and go all the way up to 4095 and then essentially loop around. Now, ordinarily, I'd look at initializing TX outside of the loop, but we actually want to pause briefly. Let's throw a few knops in there just to increase the time between note changes. Okay, let's give that a go. Okay, that feels like the frequency is changing a lot faster than I expected. So this is the first of the two axles. Okay, it's, I think it's putting out very low frequency stuff but we're hearing some high pitch bits which come from us swapping the values in too slowly. Okay. I think it's working correctly. We need to run it at a higher clock rate and have a bigger gap between changing the numbers. Okay, so I'm actually going to do my counting in B and C. Right, so this is the same principle, but I'm just putting in a longer loop in the middle. Yeah, that frequency change isn't as smooth as I'd like, but we're definitely getting the right kind of effect. I'm trying to check if I've got these bits in the right order. Okay, what I want to do here is um, confirm I'm getting the numbers back out in the order I expect. There seems to be a step change whenever an upper bit changes. Okay, sorry about that. I was just getting the scope out and realised it hadn't been recording for a little while because my camera ran out of memory. Now what you missed was, going from working out there was a noticeable tonal change whenever we wrapped across the boundary between one of the chips. You've got an idea about that. And you see the square wave gradually dropping in frequency.
then it's suddenly gone high again. I tested with my probe that we've got the expected voltages on the input pins here, but it doesn't actually seem to be doing the load. Now the load is coming off the carry out here. Okay, I think I know what's happening. Here's my theory. Now what I've got here is the same circuit that I built on the main clock, but I've, I'm replicating the carry signal out to the parallel load of three different chips. And the problem with that is the borrow line is going to start going low, but then the moment any of these chips responds to that, it's going to issue a load and then the borrow will clear again. So with one chip that's fine, this chip is always going to get its own reset data. But we don't know much about the logic inside this, and so that borrow rippling down is, is cancelling itself. And if one of the chips hasn't responded in time, we're going to basically lose bits from the counter. So what we need to do is make that borrow signal last longer. Okay, I'm going to try and work on it here because it will be a lot easier. Firstly, I want to make some room over here. Okay, so this is a 74LS00. This is four NAND gates. And what I'm going to do is use the four NAND gates to construct a set reset latch. Very similar to what we did right here. So we're tying the outputs from one NAND to the input of the other. And this one is going to come from that borrow line. I'm going to use the output of that to drive the parallel loads. Then the other input to the set reset latch is going to come all the way down here from the clock. So what I'm trying to do here is make it so instead of a signal that's dependent on its inputs performing the parallel load, we we'll use that signal to set a latch and then we reset that latch on the clock and hopefully that means we'll get a, a full cycle of that operation which will give all the chips time to operate. Of course it doesn't appear to be working but let's take a look. That's the main borrow line. We don't seem to be getting a signal on that so I'm just going to guess that I got that the wrong way around. Go from the start. That looks like it's working correctly now. Right, so let's turn this off and get back to coding. Okay, one thing that was very evident there is we didn't have a linear relationship between time and perceived frequency. That's because we've got um, an inherent divide going on. Okay, so I did find this web page which provides a list of all the MIDI notes and their frequencies. So I'm going to try and import that into some code. Right, okay. So what I've done is I've imported that table in. So there's 127 MIDI notes defined. 
and the frequencies go from 8.18 hertz all the way up to 12.543 kilohertz. So I've written some quick code to run through each of those. It's just outputting the data at the moment. Let's have a think about this. Our divisor will need to be, and this is the value that we need to put into the latches to generate the tone, 115200 divided by the frequency. And what I'm going to do there is then add 0 0.5 to give it a proper round up, round down behavior. Otherwise it always rounds it down. Okay, so that's the 440 we were putting in for middle C. Now, this is curious. We've got two in a row, no, a few in a row here with the same numbers in pairs. Actual frequency is what we're actually going to generate. So obviously we're converting it to an integer so we've got some loss in pre precision. So n.freq is what we're trying to make and then actual frequency is what we're going to generate in our circuit assuming the crystal is uh, outputting the correct value. So then error is one minus the other. Let's make sure it's positive. Right, so error P is a percentage error of the frequency we're actually getting Okay, so the numbers are really low until around about here where we start seeing upward spikes. I might try and change the, the mapping range of the numbers to see if this improves. Ah, now it's worth factoring in here that we've got a fixed range for this value. So we're getting a better results down here, but up at the top, the numbers go wildly wrong the moment we start clamping the result. Some notes with values below 21 at the moment, we've got a, or below 22, we've got a problem with. And notes above 100 start getting a little bit weird. I think we've got a, a decent working range in here though. Let's see what we can do with it. Now what I want to do is generate a note table and I'm going to make it so that entry zero, which we know is not going to render properly, I'm going to make it so it just sets that top bit that turns the sound off because that's going to be convenient to us. Now I'm thinking it's going to be convenient for us to store the high byte first, followed by the low byte. Okay, so this is a table of MIDI notes and the control codes I need to output to make it that tone. Okay, so let's paste that data in. Now, I'm aligning this to 256, because then I know I can use a simple indirection to get this. going to load audio MIDI table into TX. Is 
if we shift left A, we're effectively multiplying it by 2, and stick that into the low byte of the TX address. Actually, I think maybe I want the low byte first. Now I swap those around, so I'm just reading them in in the order I want. Output the high byte, get the low byte back off B, and output that. So basically we take the MIDI note in, look up into this table for the two bytes that we're going to output, output those to the audio register, and job done. So now we should be able to move through these notes linearly. We should probably start at about 20 or it's going to sound weird. Let's save all the registers though. Leave that same pause. Yeah, it should all be good. Don't need to keep that around anymore. Let's give that a try. Right, that's not working right. So this should be move A comma twenty. Oh that's stupid. I'm completely stomped over my own code here. That's absolutely typical programming error is you spend all your time looking and checking for the main code mistake and it's actually just a trivial error in your test code. Sounds more like it. Now this is pretty cool because now I've got a table of MIDI notes and I can play them. So what I actually need is rather than just incrementing a, a register, I need a list of note values that actually represent a tune. Okay, in the intervening time gap, I recorded the Spooky Scary Skeletons demo, which I was very proud of. But it also means I stopped and edited the previous footage. And so I do apologize that there were chunks of this video where I left the tone playing because it's not very loud to me here, but it's the little speaker is quite close to the microphone. The tune you saw in the demo, my friend Ben helped me convert from a pre-existing MIDI file. There's a link to his channel up in the corner, but the code that plays it is actually very simple. This is almost exactly the same code as I was using before to just loop through all the possible notes, but instead of incrementing A, I initialize a pointer to the start of a, a table of notes and do a lot SB, which loads the byte that SI points to and then increments SI. So for the spooky scary skeletons, there was another big table of data, and this is another MIDI file I've converted. This time I did it myself, so it's possibly not quite as good, but I will play that to you now.
This was Beethoven's Fur Elise. Now, people did ask me to play with the clock. You can see I'm still very clock speed sensitive. And if people were curious to know why I was running it off the interactive speed clock and not the crystal, that's why. It's just a little bit too quick. Okay, still to come is I want to add a bit of volume to the output. I'm going to need to add a second voice, I think, and some kind of uh, hardware to mix between them and maybe produce a a more analog output. I'm curious to know if the people watching would be interested in me doing a video on a how I generated this musical data from MIDI files, because that's kind of interesting, but it's obviously not anything to do with kind of breadboard CPUs or uh, breadboard circuitry. So if you do want to hear about that, chuck us a comment in the description and I'll maybe do a video on that. Otherwise I'll uh, go on and start adding a bit more extra circuitry. Hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.